is a little bit about one of our new initiatives at the Natural Hazard Center, which is the National Science Foundation funded Converge Initiative. And Converge is really dedicated to and committed to advancing hazards and disaster research from a convergence framework. And so I want to start out with what is convergence? Because uh, convergence has really taken root in, within the National Academies. It's one of the National Science Foundation 10 big ideas. And so convergence, what is it? Convergence builds upon principles of interdisciplinary research and it relies on webs of partnerships. And so partnerships across organizational types, government, industry, academia, the groups being brought together here, but then also across disciplinary dimensions. And just let's pause for a minute. Think about everyone in this room, if one of those organizational types goes away, if government goes away, what if the social sciences go away? How are we going to address the problems that we are facing today? And what possibilities would we imagine if engineering was missing? And so convergence is about developing the webs of partnerships that we've been talking about here. And the two core principles of convergence are that you start with a problem that is so complex and it is so big that no one of us could do it alone. No sociologist, no engineer, no natural scientist, no matter how talented, can, can solve the problem on the own because it's so complicated, it takes all of us. And it's inviting us, this is where convergence moves beyond interdisciplinarity. It invites us to move into that solution space. So one of our dear colleagues up here, sick, was sick. So imagine that if she went to the doctor, walked into the doctor, What's the thing that we ask a doctor to do when we go into a doctor? Diagnose. Yeah. Diagnose a problem and to make us feel better. So imagine if we walked into the doctor all the time and the doctor diagnosed us and said, yes, Rebecca, you have food poisoning. Or, you know, yes, you need a hip replacement. And then you stare at them and they do nothing, right? And so it's about diagnosing the problem, but also finding the solution. And we need more solutions-oriented thinking. So what are we really excited about that we are doing through this initiative? So I just want to share with you four really brief slides here about some of the work that we are doing through Converge in partnership and building upon the extraordinary 70 plus years of research that has been happening in the hazards and disaster field. So number one commitment is related to accelerating the training and mentoring of a diverse next generation of hazards and disaster researchers. We share a vision with the NSF includes minority surge project with the Bill Anderson Fund and with other groups that envision a hazards and disaster research workforce that is reflective of the diversity of this nation and the diversity of our beautiful world. And so how do we do that in an event-driven field where some have the benefit of being trained at institutions with deep histories and knowledge where the students come through, they get training and mentoring in disasters, but oftentimes what happens is a disaster happens, the field's very event-driven, and people may come in and start doing research, but they don't know there's that whole history. And so the Converge training modules, how many of you have done the IRB, have done IRB in here? So you know before you can write an IR and institutional review board proposal, you have to go through the city training modules. So the city training modules just give you a brief overview. What is human subjects research? What's the history of the IRB? Our vision with these converged modules is very similar that we want to give that sort of high level overview of the field. We rolled out two months ago the social vulnerability and disasters module. Two days ago, three days ago, we rolled out the disaster mental health module. Coming next, we have short, these are 30 minute free online training modules. If you get eight out of 10 quiz questions right at the end, you earn a certificate signed by me. And, so, and you can take the quiz as many times as you want. I won't judge you. I, I, I'll just only be happy when you get the certificate. And so um, in, in all seriousness, in the next modules, we are rolling out are on institutional review board, the ethics of hazards and disaster research and conducting emotionally challenging research. 
We're also, over the next five years, we'll be developing modules on the public communication of hazards and disaster science, forming interdisciplinary teams, social science methods, and a variety of other modules. We hope you will access these modules. Again, free, online, they are great for assistant professors who may not know what's coming in their next class, as well as for our partners and organizations and agencies. The second big thing that we are working to do through Converge is to develop best practice guidance for the ethical conduct of hazards and disaster research. One of our forever questions is how do we center ethics with hazards and disaster research as much as we center our science? Because those two things coupled together is when we think we can do the best work. And so with this ethical guidance, we have both check sheets, what do you bring with you into the field, how do you partner with local organizations, but one of the things we've been really inspired by here, Isabel's presentation yesterday, it's not just about telling people what to do, it's about trying to introduce a process. So rather than me saying, here are the 10 things that will make you ethical, here are the 10 questions that we may ask that can help us to think ethically about the many different landmines that we might confront in hazards and disaster mitigation, response, and recovery research. I hope that you will join us if you have ideas of short 700 to 1,000 word briefing sheets or check sheets that you have used that have facilitated your research. We have a partnership with the Natural Hazards Review to make these peer reviewed so that they can be adopted, but we also negotiated, that is not an open access journal, we have negotiated an open access agreement because we were unwilling to do this unless it could be free and downloadable by everyone to democratize access to knowledge and information. The next thing that we are working on through Converge, over the past year we have partnered with the University of Texas, Austin. They are developing the cyber infrastructure for the nation's hazards and disaster research facilities. They have a major multi-year NSF grant. UT Austin is home to the nation's largest supercomputing facility, TAC. And they have already developed several data models that have helped engineers to publish their data sets. There are over 200 engineering data sets that are already available via the Design Safe initiative. And so we have been partnering with them to develop the first ever social science and interdisciplinary data model to facilitate the publication of not just our data so that we can increase sharing of data but also the publication of our research instruments and protocols. And what that means is when you publish something via this, you can actually get a permanent forever digital object identifier or DOI. And so the next time somebody reaches out to Megan and says, hey Megan, I heard you have an amazing survey that you used after the Paradise Wildfires. If Megan publishes that up there, then we start citing Megan for her instrument, and then later when she's ready to release and publish the data, which many journals as well as funders are increasingly requiring, that, it natural, that all American Society of Civil Engineers journals now require the publication of data. So this is starting to open up that possibility for us to think about how can we do this? And so why is this important? Number one, I think this is important because we already have so much data. There is so much legacy data out there and I'd like to tell you a brief story about this. I'm working on a project for the U.S. Geological Survey on earthquake early warnings in schools. And we were on a phone call with the social and behavioral scientists who are doing a variety of earthquake early warning projects. And two of the researchers on that call, Jeanette Sutton and Michelle Wood, they were on there and they're doing a survey of people in Southern California to learn about the uptake of earthquake early warning. And they said, we called Ronaguchi, who is this researcher in California, he did a survey back in 1999 asking Californians about whether they might want uh, earthquake early warning systems. And so they said, Ron has already done this survey. We need to learn from what Ron already did 20 years ago. They call Ron Aguchi up. Ron says, oh yeah, I have a whole box 
of the surveys, but they're in my garage. Let me go find them. Goes out to his garage, which, mind you, Ronaguchi will probably you know, move within 10 years, and those surveys would be gone forever. Goes out into his garage, and Jeanette on this call goes, we got this box of surveys, and it was like Christmas morning at our house. And so think about what we could do if we started publishing our legacy data sets, if our graduate students could go to that legacy data and analyze it and use it. So very excited about that. Um, also excited about, I published a data set up there, and the first thing I thought was, you know, you have this moment of, oh my gosh, I'm letting my data go. But then you think, somebody is going to come along and they are going to do something. I am so excited. I'm so sorry. I keep doing this. Um, they are going to come, somebody is coming along and they're going to take that data that I put up there and they're going to do something with it that I never could have imagined. And that is the power of science. That is the power of sharing and creating a culture of sharing, which I think so much of this is about. Um, also, let's reduce our duplication. I think that's been a lot of this conversation, right? When, when do researchers need to be in the field? There are reasons we need to be in the field. Duplication, though, is oftentimes problematic for communities. The structural engineers are having many, many conversations about this, because sometimes 100 structural engineers will go out to assess a common, a common data block, right? Because they want to look at the same buildings. How can they streamline their activities? How can we streamline our activities? And then again, let's get publication credit and let's change our universities so that our assistant professors who are going up for tenure, that they start getting credit for publishing their data and sharing their data with others and moving our field forward. April 17th in Boulder, Colorado, we are going to have a Publish Your Data event specifically for social and behavioral scientists. Again, engineers have already put 200 data sets up there. Social scientists, we have like two so far. And so we really want to empower people, figure out how to put your data sets and your instruments up there. And if you would like to come to Boulder, come and see me because we'd love to have you. And we may even have a snowstorm for you in April. As well. <laughs> um, the other thing that we are doing with this facility is uh, identifying, engaging, and coordinating researchers before, during, and after disaster. The National Science Foundation has invested in six major coordinating networks for geotechnical engineers, structural engineers, operations and systems engineers, nearshore systems researchers, and also for social scientists and interdisciplinary scientists and engineers. Not only is this important so that we can get organized as diverse disciplinary communities before a disaster so we can identify where are our research gaps, where are our holes in knowledge, but also so we can talk to one another. The leaders of all of these NSF networks, we meet every single month and it has been transformative. After Dorian, the leader of the structural engineering group, she gets on the call with me as the leader of the social science group and she said, Lori, we want you to know we've already gone and done our field recon. One of the things we've learned on the ground is that there are tens of thousands of missing undocumented workers in the Bahamas that they're talking about. They don't know where they are at. And so we're feeding information to one another that's relevant across these disciplinary communities so we can be in better com communication, coordinate, and collaborate more effectively. And so this is what we have had 815 social scientists around the world who have signed up for the SCIR network. And if you go to our interactive map on converge.colorado.edu, you can click on the researchers. You can find Nicole Errett on that map if you're in Seattle, if something happens in Seattle, and you can find out about her extraordinary methodological topical expertise. And so this is about recognizing the diversity of the social and behavioral science community, our knowledge, expertise, values, and what we're all about. And so if you are a social and behavioral scientist, we hope you will join the SCIR network so that we can work together as a community. And the last thing um, I wanted to say, I wanted to end where I began with gratitude for our organizers for this extraordinary panel and for all of you. I am feeling very self-conscious right now to be standing in front of a room of people who I also know have knowledge, expertise, skills, 
networks that you are mobilizing, and we are trying to recognize that, bring it together, and amplify what you are doing. And so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for listening. And I can't wait to learn from Trisha Walkton more. Thank you. Hey, Trisha, no pressure here. <laughs> bring it on home. All right, so, so two things. One, I want to thank Lori for the clarifying that that was actually a baseball reference because I had no clue. All of me grew up in Canada, hockey or whatever. Um, the other thing I'm very cognizant of is I think we have 10 minutes left in the session. Um, not, if, not if people want to eat. <laughs> um, and I want to make sure, as, as Lori had indicated and others have said too, there's a wealth of knowledge in this room. Um, so to try to, to go through fairly quickly and condense my remarks to maybe about five minutes um, and allow us for a, at least a little bit of time to hear from the, the audience and some of the great things that you're doing. Um, I'm going to, to focus my comments on one of, mainly one of the questions that Tom had posed to us, focusing on the um, critical skills uh, that are needed for the next generation. I want to start off by telling you a little bit about the center that I am with uh, to give you some context and would be happy to answer some questions on that uh, in the Q&A or after the session is done. Uh, so again, my name is Tricia Wachendorf. I'm a co-director of the Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware. Uh, our center was founded in 1963 by uh, Enrico Corintelli and Russell Dines, um, and, and we have just a, a very strong legacy of conducting research initially on the, the social aspects, especially the sociology aspects of disasters, but our center has really uh, transformed itself over the past uh, half century and, and especially over the past 10 years to approach these questions in a very interdisciplinary way. Our mission includes research, education, and dissemination and engagement. I'll talk a little bit about those, but I'm also speaking in a panel tomorrow where I'm gonna get into a little bit more meat about some of the engagement activities. We currently have 11 core faculty members and two core emeritus faculty members. One of the things about joining the DRC is you never leave, we never let you go. Um, and these are faculty members who are very much engaged in every aspect of center life and engagement with students and research. So I know some centers might have um, uh, people who are involved as faculty that are loosely connected. Uh, these are very strongly engaged faculty members representing such fields and disciplines as sociology, as public policy, public health, civil engineering, anthropology, uh, really doing work in their core disciplines, their core departments, uh, where we have degree programs, students at the graduate and undergraduate level specializing in sociology with a concentration in disasters, in public policy, in civil engineering, focused on risk modeling, as well as supporting our interdisciplinary disaster science and management program that allows students to really engage in cross-cutting research, um, take courses and departments uh, across the university, and really see their work as, as spanning boundaries uh, that are more traditionally within the, the discipline. We also have a data repository where we have, uh, kind of spearing off of what, what Lori indicated, uh, a collection not only of our research that we've conducted at the center over the past half century, uh, but also as people are clearing out their, their basements and their garages or their spouses are saying, get rid of this stuff, uh, we've, been, we've been host to uh, the strategic bomb surveys. We have Joseph Scanlon from Canada. We had a truck that, that went down and got um, boxes, loads of stuff. Uh, and being really able to use that work both in terms of a historical data analysis, making that available to researchers, not just our students, but people coming from across the world to make use of that data. Um, we also have a library collection of over 125,000 items focused on the social science and management aspects of disasters and a dedicated assistant director of archives and collections, uh, making that available not only to our students but to visiting scholars and practitioners as well. Um, I want to share this again, so I'm hoping to elaborate a little bit on um, the way that you might be able to think of leveraging your resources, um, approaching with us as well, uh, but also to kind of focus for this talk about the 
uh, the technical skills, the broader skills that we have found that are very important for our students moving forward uh, that might be helpful for, for you as well. Um, so I want to start off with uh, thinking about a graduate student who, a former graduate student of our center, uh, and the experience that that student had engaging in quick response field work. Quick response field work is one of the core centers of, uh, core cornerstones of what our center has done. We've engaged in over 700 field studies over the past half century. Uh, and this was a graduate student who entered the field uh, not to conduct in-depth interviews or surveys, but to do that very low maintenance exploratory research engaged in observation, in listening, in having informal conversations, in taking notes, to really set the stage for a larger uh, study down the road. And as the student came back and engaged in that debriefing process, the student indicated, I'm asking the wrong questions. So I don't mean the wrong questions like a specific question, but what brought that student into the field, the initial topic, was something that was interesting, but there were other important issues that were emerging that were much more important, much more valuable to focus on, and that student was able to pivot, to recast what they were looking at, to take advantage of that situation and being in that environment, and really focusing on what was important to the scholarship, what was important in terms of applied lessons. But there were certain things that were absolutely essential for them to do that. One of that is rigor. And so one of the things that we do in, in terms of our program, whether or not you're talking about the core departments and disciplines like sociology or civil engineering, or thinking about the interdisciplinary program, is a focus on knowing the literature that has come before. That student was familiar with what had already been done, they were well versed in the literature and they could identify the gaps. What's something new that I can contribute? What's an area that's going to be really important and take advantage of my time in the field that is going to make a difference to theory or is going to make a difference in practice? That's involved in that rigorous exercise of knowing the literature, of being able to draw on the literature for that new question and really being able to do that in the moment. So not something where a year is going to go by, like they might be writing with their proposal, but in that moment to be able to be well versed in that rigorous knowledge of the literature and be able to adapt it. Um, so for some of our students, that involves breadth. Um, it may be the, the disciplinary science program where students are engaged in that boundary spanning research. They're looking at interdisciplinary disaster literature from a broad range of areas and they're able to pull that in to take a, 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 a breadth approach to their topic. For other students, it's focused on depth. So whether they have a deep knowledge in sociology, a deep knowledge in geography, a deep knowledge in, in, in civil engineering and modeling, and their ability to, to be able to bring that to the table. But in both cases, that rigor is absolutely important. So if I'm thinking about that example for my own undergraduate classes, um, I think back to a disaster science class that I taught uh, that had a, a student who pursued uh, a career in state emergency management, a student who pursued a career uh, in national uh, government agencies and private consulting, and a student who pursued a, a PhD and got a tenure track position in the first college of its kind um, here at the University of Albany. Um, and for all of those undergraduates, that rigorous uh, attention was absolutely important. And that extends to rigor in terms of methodology. Uh, thinking about knowing GIS, quantitative methods, qualitative methods, methods, risk analysis, modeling, um, doesn't matter which one, but really being able to know that well and to employ that in the field. Um, quickly, another important thing is looking at vision. So as we look at the rigorous attention, that student was also able to imagine what the questions were to be. Um, to not be stuck in looking at only those important incremental advances to research, but thinking about what is the next leap, what is that going to involve. So when I start thinking about what it takes to bring someone to the moon, that involves technical skills, it involves incremental steps, but it also involves creativity, imagination, and vision, and those are the kinds of approaches that we need in this broader uh, attention to dealing with the big problems of disasters. Um, no, it's 
I want to quickly give one example from uh, a way that we are able to extend some of the functions that we've had uh, with the university and engage in the community. And I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Uh, but for those of you who are on Twitter, if you want to look up our hashtag UDELDRC uh, or the hashtag DRC it, this is a new initiative where we have tried to address um, the burning questions that we are asked by the media, uh, by government agencies, and to make the science of disasters more accessible. It involved uh, two graduate students, Connor Dacey and Karen uh, uh, Montos Baris, um, as well as uh, another student, Amy Mankins and uh, Logan uh, Gerber Chavez, um, working to develop a, a methodology, uh, looking at the literature and making these, they're starting off with the topic of why people don't evacuate in a hurricane. Uh, focusing on making these big uh, 10, 15 page summaries, making a, a shorter two to five page summary, making a six to eight minute animated video, having a bibliography available. Uh, so this is something that is grounded in science, an extensive treatment of the literature, but trying to make it accessible to someone who wants a summary, a shorter summary. I don't got time for that. I just want to watch the video and get the point um, and to focus on that again. Uh, so that's just one example, and I know that we're already at 12.15, so I'm going to just stop. Can you just please right repeat, there. can you just please repeat that? Yes, it's, if you go on Twitter, I just uploaded it today, Udell DRC, uh, which is our Twitter account, and you could also do the hashtag DRC it. DRC it? DRC it, DRC IT. Thank you. Thank you. This has been an extraordinary session with uh, incredible presentations. Please join me in giving all of our uh, We can take about five minutes for questions. Uh, I know we're past the, the, the deadline. If you're hungry, go go eat. But uh, and I'm sure the panel will still stay as long as long as you can to talk to them or until they walk out the door to get something to <laughs> Please, any, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have one question for Dr. Gurdani. Um, well, you mentioned that your university really transforms programs, and you said something about you were doing all these new things on top of the original mission and duties of your faculty and so on. Can you say more about how that happened in terms of financing, funding, or like, like, pay times, or was there a period of recess? And how did that actually even just really get, get worked out? Well, thank you very much for the question. I think it's um, um, it is um, uh, the very tough decision that I actually um, uh, we have gone through that exercise. That um, the in the case of um, uh, the disaster in the earthquake and in the tsunami happens, that at that time we had to stop the uh, classrooms anyway. And then also, uh, the entire Japan, particularly the northern north part of Japan, they actually had a three days uh, uh, outage of the power. Uh, and then also, particularly the area of the uh, uh, coastal, uh, the affected area, the one month to three months out of, uh, out of power. So, uh, so that they didn't have any means of the communication, any means of the, uh, what's, uh, to find out what's going on. So what happened is that the, at the university, they are uh, they they stop the uh, the classrooms. Of course, it's in the, also it was the spring time. It's, it's almost changing the, the, the annual uh, the academic year. So that they finish that. So basically, what they're trying to do is that they're preparing for the next year uh, entrance and also starting the new semesters because Japan's fiscal year starting. April. So the, the things happen the March 12, uh, 11th. So just only for two two uh, two weeks come to, uh, three weeks to uh, to a new uh, new new uh, academic year started. So that they they actually had to stop everything at that time until Mar uh, the May next uh, May for for the another months. So what what they did was that the during that the time and also this. The university also uh, trying to find out everybody is in, in safe 
or not. All, all of the students, faculty members, they really need to spend their time to find out where they are, where, where the, uh, uh, they are. And then also those people, those students who are from the coastal area, their parents also, a number, number of parents also uh, passed, you know, victimized. They themselves also uh, lost, lost their, you know, parents' houses and all those. So, so first, first, uh, first months, they really need to spend the time to find out the fact finding, what's going on, what's there happening. And at the same time, they really wanted to make sure that the students, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, how to say, treated, you know, the, with the, um, uh, the, like, their way of living. That was the first things we actually spent our time together with a number of faculty members and staff. Then secondly, what happened is that this is the time that this university may have to really, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, 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 that, it's a shock to everybody. It's a 1,000 year thing happens. It's a shock to everybody. So that we had to actually change the, our mentality to, to invoke, to support that those people who actually face a difficulty in the coastal area. So that the, they really wanted to make sure that there's something they need to do. Not only by saying that the president of the university is saying you have to do it. No. From these faculty members, they themselves actually went out to the each coastal areas, there's a, like a vast area, like how to say, at least a 200 miles long, you know, the coast. So that each, there's a 13 municipalities. So they actually went out to find out what, what they can do. And then the faculty members, and then, of course, some, it's, it's not everybody, 100%. It's the, probably more than 50% of the faculty members actually went out to finding out what's going on. There is there's anything that they can do voluntarily, or they can do some kind of the, the construct, uh, the, the, the uh, rescue, risk, rescue processes, you know, shelter operations. Um, they can, they would, they did anything they, they can. In other words, without any disciplinary, in any subjects, regardless of their expertise, they actually conduct everything. So from that point, we actually come together and then saying that, yes, we really need to do something for the society. So that's the, 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 the of course they need, they have a responsibility to teach at the uh, regular uh, subjects. But at the same time, we formalize that their number of the voices are raised. We need to do something. That's the reason why we come up with us the different layers of the structure uh, of the, uh, the dealing with that issues. So the financially, we, yes, we actually request that the, the central government that this is the way you're going to do. We really need to do it anyway. So that's the, the Japanese government basically said that, okay, you have a, a number of the uh, pro programs actually conducted. So that's the, the university, you have to do this and that. Well, we said we want to do this and that. So that's the, 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 the Ministry of uh, Education said, okay, we, we, uh, they, they uh, provided budget, addition to that, the regular budget. So that's, that's the, the financial actually uh, being, uh, finances actually cleared. So, so from there, uh, of course, some, some uh, faculty 